Good evening, everyone. Good to have you with us tonight. Hope you're ready for a continual study from God's Word. Those were some good calls that were coming in on Mark's program that one lady was having a pretty good discussion. And, uh, you know, that's really what we, we were trying to do. The, the, the last caller said we seem not to argue, but, you know, making an argument is not bad. It's just simply reasoning together and um, to, you know, set forth and dispute is, is, is all, are all scriptural things that we're doing. And we hope that you would recognize that, uh, that that's what we're trying to accomplish on this program, on our programs. When we are, you know, we're simply asking the community what uh, we ourselves would want. If we were asking a question, we would want to ask, you know, well, what does the Bible say? And if we are uh, trying to uh, obtain an answer, you know, that's the kind of answer we want back, is we want a word from the Lord. We want to know what God's word on this matter is. And so that's what we're trying to um, set forth on all of our programs, and that's why we open the phone lines up. We want discussion, dialogue, and so we'll be opening those Phone lines up uh, momentarily tonight as well. Uh, Here's how you can reach me. Uh, My name is James, uh, 276-340-2653. My phone number, a word from Lord at gmail.com is how you can reach me. And I hope that you will uh, send me an email and let me know that you're watching and have any Bible questions. I'd be glad to answer them, set up a Bible study. Uh, Having uh, some uh, uh, Bible studies with people down in Burlington of of late and... uh, it's, uh, you know, it's good when you're finding people that are interested in, in just, you know, let's sitting down at the table and open the Bible up and let's find out what thus saith the Lord is. And so, uh, anyway, you know, tonight I'm just going to kind of do a basic lesson here, uh, talk about some things that uh, I know uh, you've probably heard before, but uh, also some things sometimes we need to talk about that are, you know, uh, oftentimes a little... A little different, you might say, or not necessarily different, but uh, talk about some things that, um, in such a way that maybe cause you to think about them a little differently, I guess is what I'm trying to say. The idea that oftentimes we can hear a thing and we can think a thing and believe a thing and we can actually hear something uh, uh, contrary to that time and time again until finally it just clicks. Oh, that is what uh, is being said. You know, now I understand. And that's what we're trying to do when we talk to people, talk to preachers. You know, we're really trying to find out what, where, is, where it is you're coming from. You know, what are you trying to say here? And uh, sometimes we have to ask those questions over and over and over before it finally clicks. And so that may be what, what it's like when you're studying the Bible, when you hear some of these uh, 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 programs, you hear some of our lessons, and you may think, well, they're all just, they're harping on the same thing all the time. No, friends, it may be that we're trying to get you to finally see what the Bible is clearly saying. And we want to uh, uh, do our best to uh, make that point. So when you hear the question, what does uh, the Bible say about what you must do to be saved? You know, that's a question, that's a biblical question that individuals have asked about to obtain salvation. I mean, I think that is one of the most fundamental questions a person can ask when they realize that there is a, a, a God and there is a, a way of salvation or they are in need of a Savior. And so they want to know what must we do. And on two occasions, in Acts chapter 2 and verse 37, that question was, was asked. And then again in Acts uh, uh uh, 16, it was asked again, but notice the next two, verse 37, now when they heard this, they were preaching in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? That is, what shall we do to be saved? Now, Peter already said to them in uh, verse 22, if you back up to verse 22, he says uh, to, the, to this same crowd, I'm sorry, verse 21, it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So the logical response is when he gets to the end of his sermon, or not necessarily to the end of the sermon, but when he gets to that point where he's convicting them of sin, that is that they have killed the Christ, they respond, what shall we do? And so it is is a logical uh, conclusion. They're asking, what shall we do to be saved? 
since if you call on the name of the Lord to be saved, then what shall we do? So apparently there's more to just saying Jesus, but they're asking what must we do? In other words, what, what must we do to be saved? How can we obtain salvation? In Acts 16, Acts 16 uh, and verse 30, Same question. Here's the uh, the Philippian jailer. He's he's thinking that all the prisoners are escaped and he's going to kill himself. And Paul and Silas tell him, "Don't don't harm yourself." And he springs in with a light and he says, "Sirs, what must I do to be saved?" And so they're going to answer that question. Well, whenever we ask that question, or whenever someone asks us that question, oftentimes we'll give them an answer that they don't seem to like. Uh, sometimes you give people the Bible answer and they're, they're fine with that. But notice this, sometimes when you ask people this question, they'll say, well, you know, they kinda, they'll kind of hedge a little bit. They don't know if I want to do that. Uh, if someone asks me, what must I do to be saved? Then I would respond just as Peter did in Acts 2, verse 38. In Acts 2, verse 38, Peter said, uh, Acts 2, verse 38, they said, Many brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, uh, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. All right? Now, so they asked the question, What shall we do? And Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. That was what they needed to do to be saved. Now, these individuals were baptized for the remission of sins. In order to have their sins remitted, they were baptized. They were baptized by the authority of Christ. That is to say, in the name of Christ, <clears throat> baptized by his authority, which is what he commanded in Mark 16, 15 and 16. So Peter said, repent and be baptized in order to obtain remission of sins. Now, that's what they did to be saved. Now, why not be saved like them? You know, if you ask a, a preacher, a denominational preacher, would you tell someone in order to be saved, be baptized for the remission of sins? I would say 99% of them are going to tell you no. They would not say that. I know uh, that we have talked to individuals who would actually come out and who actually said, I would not tell people what Peter told people. And then they give all kinds of reasons why. But I'm saying if someone asked Peter what to do to be saved, then that seems like a good answer for people today. What must I do to be saved? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Now, if you tell someone that today, <clears throat> oftentimes they are going to take exception to that, or they're going to, uh, like I said, they're going to hedge on a little bit. They're not really going to want to do that. And so probably one of the things they're going to say is, well, what about the thief on the cross? What about the thief on the cross? What about the thief on the cross? So what about the thief on the cross? People say, well, why not be saved like the thief on the cross? He wasn't baptized. He wasn't baptized, was he? Well, I don't think you could prove he was or he wasn't. But the question is not really, was he baptized? The question is, why do you want to be saved like the thief on the cross? And really when it gets down to it, most people want to be saved like the thief on the cross simply because he wasn't baptized. They'll actually tell you that. Well, he wasn't baptized. Now, friends, what I want you to think about tonight is I want you to think about the fact that if you want to be saved like the thief on the cross, uh, there are some other options available to you. I mean, if you're just not wanting to be baptized, you want to be saved like someone, but you don't want to... Uh, be baptized? Well, there's some other options. I mean, I'm just thinking, you know, we, people kind of wear the thief on the cross out. I mean, he's kind of getting tired. You know, people just, they draw him like a dagger. You know, well, what about the thief on the cross? Well, what about some other people? But first of all, let's look at the thief on the cross. And why is it that individuals want to be saved like the thief on the cross? Well, let's look at it. In Luke 23, here's our text. Luke 23 and verse... Uh, 33, I guess you might say. We'll start there. And they were come to the place which is called Calvary. There they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand 
and the other on the left. Verse 34. Then, Jesus, then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots. And the people stood uh, beholding, and the rulers uh, also with him derided him, saying he saved others. Let him save himself. Now, let's go on down to verse 39. That's really where we get to the, <clears throat> to the thieves. And one of the malefactors which were hanged uh, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost, thou, dost not thou fear God, seeing that thou art in the same condemnation? We indeed justly, for we receive the due uh, reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. All right? Now, then he said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Now, when people say, well, what about the thief on the cross? They're trying to get around something. So you say, you want to be saved like the thief on the cross. All right? Well, the thief, he had reverence for God. You know, he recognized that that God was a just God. He recognized that he was in the position he was in because of his deeds. And he recognized that, that Jesus was the Son of God, or he recognized that Jesus was, was in a position to forgive his sins, or he was in a position to, of, of some kind of authority. So uh, he said, you know, he, told the, he rebuked the other one, the other malefactor, the other thief. And then he also had a request of Christ in verse 43. He said, uh, remember me when I come to him in thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, verily I say unto thee, thou shalt be with me, today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Now, here's the thief on the cross. Now, I don't know which one it is. When people say, what about the thief on the cross? I don't know if they're talking about the one on the left or the right. You know? So, you know, maybe we need to be more specific. You know, which thief you want to be saved by? Well, I know which one you're talking about. You're talking about the one that actually confessed the Lord or recognized Jesus as Lord and said, remember when you come into your kingdom. Now, that's what you want to do? You want to be saved like this thief? You want to be saved like this thief? Well, friends, let's think about this. Uh, can you ask the Lord to remember you when he comes in his kingdom? Now, I don't think I've ever heard anyone say a quote-unquote sinner's prayer that says, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom. Mark, have you? I mean, every little track I pick up, it always says, you know, I ask Jesus to come into your heart. Well, why don't you pray like the thief did? Lord, remember me when you come in your kingdom. See, when people say, well, I want to be saved like a thief on the cross, they don't, even, they don't even go about doing it like the thief on the cross. I'm, I'm just trying to help you all be consistent. If you want to be saved out of the thief on the cross, then at least get your prayer right. Lord, remember me when you're coming to your kingdom. Now, why do you want to be saved like this thief? It has to do because you're trying to get around baptism, I know. But there's some other options. There's some other options we're going to look at. Other options available to you. So why the thief on the cross? Let me make this point to you, by the way. You want to be saved like the thief on the cross? Well, why don't you say, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom? Now, most of you could do that because you don't believe the kingdom has already come. Now, this is the point that Mark was, was trying to get the lady to see that was calling in. But here's the thing. Jesus said, Jesus said that upon this rock I'll build my church, and he's going to give key, Peter the keys to the kingdom. Now, if you're still waiting for Jesus to come and set up a kingdom then you need to realize that you've missed the kingdom, number one, but you're also saying there are some other people that are still alive that are over 2,000 years old. Because look what, Jesus, look what Jesus said in Mark chapter 9, verse 1. And I'm, I'm talking to the lady that called in. Please consider this. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, there be some that stand here which shall not taste death, so they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now, if the kingdom of God, if the kingdom has not come, there are some people who have not tasted death. Now, 
while you're looking for your verse that says Jesus is going to come back and set on the, step foot on the ground, I would wish I wish you would consider this. How is it that he's going to establish a kingdom that Jesus said would be established within the lifetime of some of the people that were standing there listening to him? If the kingdom has not come, then you've got some people that are, or at least one person, that's still waiting around for the kingdom to come. Now, as one preacher said, Eli James, uh, the the uh, the KKK clud, as he said, he said, well, this is a problematic verse. Well, it's a problem if you don't believe the kingdom has already come. But Jesus said it's going to be established, and there's going to be some that are going to that are going to be alive when they see it established. And so, if you're going to be like the thief, you're going to be saved like the thief, you're going to have to request, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom, but you're not going to be saved that way because the kingdom has already come. So now what you're going to do? You got, you're in a dilemma now. You're going to be saved like the thief who said, Lord, remember me when you come to your kingdom, and the kingdom has already come. Uh-oh, maybe you need another option. Maybe you need to be saved some other way because you were just citing the thief on the cross because you didn't want to be baptized. Well, never fear, friends. I have some help for you. I have some help for you. All right, well, we've got a call coming in, so I'll go ahead and take this call. You got a word from the Lord? Oh, hi. Uh, hi. May I speak to the fellow again? I found a verse for him. Okay, I'm going to, uh, well, I'm, you're on the air now. You want to just give it for the, what, what verse are you looking for? Go okay, ahead. I'm in Revelation 20, uh, 20 verse 4, and the second half of it is, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now that's supposed to be on the earth. Okay, okay, all right, let's. Let's stop right here. Let's let's take this. Revelation 20 and verse, th- verse 4. Verse 4. All right. It's a long verse, but the part okay. I want is the last sentence. All right. Well, let's, let's, let's read up to the last sentence. How about that? I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given unto them, and I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness. Whoops. Sorry about that. Um... My Bible program not acting right. All right. I'm sorry about that. All right. Um, they were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Now, why do you assume that that is their reigning on earth? Aren't they? <laughs> well, it doesn't say they're reigning on earth. It just says they're reigning with Christ. Okay. You see that? If anything I was ever taught, they're reigning here. Okay. And then eventually after the thousand years, we all go to heaven or something. Okay. Now watch this. Here, here's, here's something else I'd like for you to consider. One, it doesn't say they're reigning on earth. And number two... It actually says that they're reigning with Christ a thousand years and not that Christ is reigning a thousand years. Christ is already reigning. They're just reigning. That This is talking about their reign, yeah. not Christ's reign. Do you see what I'm saying? There's a difference in saying Christ is going to come and reign for a thousand years and what the Bible actually says is Christ is already reigning right now. I believe he is, but he hasn't put Satan in the pit yet, which is why some of us get a hard time. <laughs> he, he hasn't put what? You believe he I'm is? I'm sorry? You said you believe he is? In other he... words, uh, the thousand years is when Satan is put in the pit, and then they let him out to cause trouble for a little while. Uh, but I believe Jesus is reigning right now, but unfortunately the devil is running around too. Okay. Which is why some of us who are Christians get a hard time. So, all right. Well, well let me ask you this. How is Jesus reigning if he's not king? He is somehow reigning because he's reigning from heaven. 
All right. So, but at the, you know, at the end of the tribulation, he takes Satan and he sticks him in the okay. bottomless pit. Okay. All right. Watch this. Demons. All right. Watch this. Watch this. If Jesus is already reigning, then that means he's a king. And if he has, if he, he's a king. if he's a king, then doesn't he need to have a kingdom? Yeah, and he said when he was here, his kingdom was not of this world. Okay. Now, but did you read the? Did you see, hear the verse that I just? I put up here just a little bit ago, Mark 9, 1. Jesus said, There'll be some that stand here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God come with power. So if the kingdom hasn't come, then can you name me someone who's still alive? No, the kingdom came when he was crucified and then resurrected. Wait a minute. At that point, he took the keys of hell and death back from the devil. Okay, wait a minute, though. You just said he's going he's, he's coming to establish a kingdom. Yeah, right now he said, my kingdom is not of this world when he was here. He had but, not yet but he said the kingdom Satan on the cross or been resurrected. But Mark 9 says the kingdom was going to come within a lifetime of some of these people. How did yeah, the, so it did. It did. Because he was speaking to the, them, and it was certainly but, within their lifetime that okay, he okay. would, you know, many of their lifetimes that he was crucified, then okay, resurrected. But here's the thing. Here's, and then here's the 40 problem. days later, ascended into heaven. All right, here's the problem, though. How is How did the kingdom come? In, let's say, Mark 9, 1, how did the kingdom come in this lifetime, in their lifetime, and yet you're saying the kingdom hasn't been established? You can't have it both ways. Yeah, well, I'm saying when he was here, he was saying his kingdom was not of this world. I understand that. It's a spiritual he kingdom. He didn't defeat Satan until he died on the cross and was resurrected. Okay, ma'am, but stop. But wait a minute, wait a minute, though. Wait a minute, ma'am. See... Here, ma'am, here, here's the problem. Here's the problem. You make a statement and then you run, and we just need to take this one step at a time here. How did okay. Jesus? How did Jesus establish his kingdom, and yet hasn't established his kingdom? If his kingdom came here, how was it going to come again later? Yeah, but he's coming back, isn't he? But is he coming to establish his kingdom? No, but he's coming back to get us. So the kingdom is already established? I'm not sure. Okay. You tell me, because now you have uh, me confused. Okay, <laughs> all right. I'm saying the kingdom is already established. The kingdom is a spiritual kingdom. It's not a physical kingdom. It will right. never it's be... it's not of this world. That's exactly but, right. John 18, 36, it's not of this world. It's a spiritual kingdom. It will never, it will never be established upon the earth. When Jesus comes oh. back, when Jesus comes back, the Bible says he's going to deliver up the, he's going to deliver up the uh, kingdom to the Father. Look at this. In John, uh, in, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 24, Then cometh the end when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and, uh, whoops, and, all rule and authority and power, for he must reign till all enemies... Uh, hath been put under his feet, and the last yeah, enemy shall be dead. Says in Psalm 91. So, so when he comes back, he's going to put down authority. He's going to give up his authority. So, how is he going to start reigning if, when he comes back, he's actually ending his reign? I don't know that he's ending his reign. He's coming to establish his reign on earth. That's what I believe. Okay, but I'm saying we haven't found the verse for that. You haven't found a verse where he's establishing his kingdom on earth. And I'm, I've showed you a verse that his kingdom was going to come in the lifetime of some of the people that were listening to him. Mark 9, 1. Right. Paul said, we are translated into the kingdom, Colossians 1 and verse 13. So the kingdom had to already be there, right? He so delivered we're us translated the... into his spiritual kingdom, but we're still right now fighting Satan who runs... Uh, this okay. world. But you know what? We're a, we're always fighting a spiritual battle. We're never fighting a yeah. physical battle. That's when Jesus said, "My kingdom's not of this world." He said, "If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight?" 
Yeah. But we're talking about a yeah. spiritual kingdom. It will never be a physical kingdom in the sense of an earthly headquarters, an earthly throne. Jesus cannot reign on the throne on this earth and be a and be a priest and a king. So I'm just saying the kingdom has already come. It's already been established. Christ is reigning. And the next time he comes, that's going to be the the end of his reign. He's going to put down authority. He's going to give up his authority and power and turn it back over to God. Take the kingdom back up to God. 1 Corinthians 15. Oh, my goodness. This would be a great oh. study. This would be a great study sometime. Do you live in uh, Danville or Reedsville? Or you live Danville. Around, where? Danville. Da- Danville? Well, how about yeah. how about we set up a Bible study sometime and just where we can really kind of, you know, lay this all out, hash it out, sit across the table, cup of coffee, whatever. I know Mark Mark lives in Danville. Mark will be glad to come and study. If you want me to come, I'll be glad to do that too, whatever. But I'm just saying this would be, you know, the time constraints on TV kind of put us in a bind here. Would you be open for that? Oh, I know. Yeah, I know. I know. Okay, yeah, we will do that sometime. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll put you on hold, and you can give Mark your, your name and phone number, or, you know, y'all can uh, arrange something and sure. uh, talk about it. How's that sound? Yeah, and I'm still looking for that, that verse. I wasn't able to find it off the top of my head. Okay, all right, well. I keep hearing on TV, you know, he comes back, his feet touch the Mount of Olives. Right. I've heard it a million times on right. TV. I'm still okay. looking for that. I couldn't find it, but let's okay. do that then. Okay. All right. I'm going to put you on hold. Stay, stay on okay. the line. Stay on the line. All right, Mark. That's three or four. It's 484 number. Okay. All right. Good call. Good call. All right, folks. So <clears throat> back to the thief. All right. We kind of left him hanging. <laughs> no pun there. All right. So why do you want to be saved with a thief on the cross? Well, you're trying to get around baptism. Trying to get around baptism. So, but you can't. Uh, you can't use the thief because the thief said, remember when you come to your kingdom, the kingdom's already established, so you need another alternative to get around baptism. Okay, well, here it is. What about, what about, uh, let's see, what about the, uh, Sorry about that. I'm having. What about the man who had palsy, the palsy patient? Let's look at Luke 5. Here's a man. Now, you, you know, you, I know you don't want to, uh, you don't want to be baptized. So here's a man. Here's a man who was saved. And let's see how he was saved. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in. And to lay him before him. That's to lay him before Christ. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling uh, with his couch into the midst before Jesus. And when they saw their, when he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. <clears throat> All right. There it is. Right there. That's the magic word, right? Thy sins are forgiven thee. Now, someone someone today might say, what must I do to be saved? And I say, well, repent and be baptized everyone in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Acts 2.38. And you say, no, I don't want to be baptized. Well, what about the palsy patient? What about the man with palsy? You know, I hear all the time, well, saved by faith only. Saved by faith. Saved by faith. Saved by faith. Saved by faith, period. Saved by faith only. Saved by whatever. Well, let's just see. Why don't why don't anyone want to cite this man? Why don't they want to say, "Hey, I want to be saved like the palsy patient"? I mean, he was determined to go. You know, his friends were determined. Now, I know, I know, some of you out, out there have some friends that want you to be saved, and they'd be glad to take you and do you do whatever it took for you to have your sins forgiven. Even to the point these friends tore open a roof and let the man down so that he could be in the midst of Jesus, in the midst where Jesus was. So, so this man, you know, he had, he had a lot going for him. So he's saved by faith because notice this, verse 20, 
Verse 20, when he saw their faith. That's not just the four friends' faith. That's the man's faith included there. He said, man, thy sins are forgiven thee. So this man was saved not only by his faith, but he was saved by the faith of his four friends. Now, again, why why didn't anyone say, well, I want to be saved like this man? I mean, he wasn't baptized. Right? Isn't that what you're trying to get around? Trying to get around uh, uh, being baptized? I mean, why not be saved like him? Why why didn't he be saved like him? Why don't you just find your four friends that believe that you can be saved, that believe your sins are forgiven, and let them save you just on their faith? You know? Look, look. Let me tell you something, friends. If If this would work, If this was the means by which you could save someone, you could bypass baptism, I can assure you that there are a lot of people that I would help save by simply having faith. I would find three more people. You know, I would would go get Mark, Micah, and Caleb, and I'd say, hey, let's go save somebody today. Let's have faith, and let's just let them be saved. Jesus saved people based upon faith. The faith of four friends. All right? So let's, let's find four people. Or let, let's, get, let's go find someone. Us four, let's go together find someone. And let's save someone without baptism. Friends, you know that won't work. The reason why you don't want to be saved that way is because you know you can't be saved on others' faith. Now, I don't care what the Catholics say. The Catholics say you can be baptized, you know, you go into purgatory and you can get them out of purgatory. Or the, the Mormons, you be baptized for the dead and save some people by, you know, by, by being baptized by proxy. But you cannot be saved on the faith of others. Look at this in Philippians 2, verse 12. Philippians 2, verse 12. What does Paul say? He says, Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. You, you, your own, uh, you're going to be on the judgment seat based upon your own works. You're going to be there by yourself, friends, in the sense of you're going to be standing alone. No one is going to stand there with you. You can't say, well, Mama helped me, Daddy helped me, Grandma helped me. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive that everyone may receive the things done in their bodies, whether it be good or bad. Second Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter five and verse ten. <clears throat> we must all appear that everyone may receive the things done in his body. You are going to be judged based upon what you do. Your actions are going to be judged. You're, you're going to be standing there giving account for yourself. Galatians 6 and verse 5, Paul said, Every man shall bear his own burden. Now, I believe that if someone if someone wanted to be saved and not, be, not have to uh, be baptized, that this is a much more viable option, even the palsy man, just being saved by faith, getting four friends to take him somewhere, would be a much more viable option than the thief on the cross, wouldn't you? Well, you know what? Maybe not. You know why? Because one thing, one thing's missing. The man with palsy, he had four friends, and they all had faith. And he had faith. But here's the problem. The problem was he was in the presence of Jesus. He was in the physical presence of Jesus, and Jesus said, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. So, well, you want to get around baptism for the remission of sins? You can't really cite the thief on the cross because he said, remember me when you come in the kingdom. And you can't say that to Jesus today because the kingdom's already come. You can't be saved like the man with palsy because, well, after all, he was let down in the presence of Jesus. And, uh, and Jesus made the statement, your sins are forgiven you. So that's not going to work. Maybe we need to find another option. Okay, well, let's do that. Let's find another option here. How about the publican? Let's be saved like the publican. 
All right? Let's look at this. In Luke chapter 19. <clears throat> Luke 19. Beginning of verse 1. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was of the chief, which was the chief among the publicans. And he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before, climbed up in the sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, to, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and he came down and received him joyfully. And when he saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood, beholding, uh, uh, said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore, I restore him fourfold. <clears throat> now, friends, let's think about this. You're trying to get around baptism, right? Well, why not be saved like Zacchaeus? Why not be saved like the publican? I mean, you know, he, had, he was a very penitent man. He was a very penitent man. Look at this. In verse 8, let's back up and look at verse 8 again. He said, The half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Now, why didn't anyone do that? I mean, that's, that's the right attitude, right? I'm going, I'm going to repay those I've wronged. I'm willing to give. I mean, the Bible says, you know, blessed are the, the poor in spirit. Right? Matthew chapter 5 and verse 3. Uh, Matthew 5 and verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Verse 8. Uh, blessed are the uh, pure in heart, for they shall see God. I think I think the publican has the right attitude here. Why didn't anyone want to be saved like him? I mean, you can't be saved like the thief. You, you can't ask Jesus. When, remember, when you come to your kingdom, he's already come in his kingdom. You can't you can't be saved like the man with palsy, right? Because why? Well, he had four friends. You can't be saved by the friend, faith of others the faith of others, and plus that he was in the presence of Jesus, so that, that's not going to work. But what about what about this publican? What about Zacchaeus? Let's look at this. Let's go back to our text in Luke 10. I'm sorry, Luke uh, 19, 10. I missed a letter here. Number. <clears throat> Verse 9 Jesus said, this day is salvation come to his house. For so much as he also is the son of Abraham. For the son of man is come to seek and save that which is lost. Now, why, not, why don't you want to be saved like this man? Oh, oh, I see. Yeah, he gave half of his goods to the poor. Oh, you, you, you kind of like what you have, right? You want to hold on to your your money, don't you? I mean, but but he wasn't baptized. If he had wronged somebody, he restored them fourfold. <clears throat> Why don't you want to be saved like him? I mean, hey, it's all about not getting wet, right? I mean, Jesus said today salvation has come. Why don't we be saved like him? Oh, I see why. You know what? You can't be saved like him either. You know why? Well, number one, look again what Jesus said. Jesus said, Today salvation has come to this house for so much as he also is the son of Abraham. Zacchaeus was a Jew. He was already in a covenant relationship with God. He was already a child of God. And so all he had to have was his sins forgiven. He was already in a, in a right relationship. He could say, you know, he could be like the the, uh, the publican who was praying in the temple. You know, have mercy on me, a sinner. 
And also, again, he was in the presence of Jesus. Jesus said, today salvation has come to this house. So, I mean, you can give away half your stuff to the poor. I mean, that would probably be good for you. If you want to give half your stuff away to the poor, that's great. If you want to have, if you want to give people that you've wronged uh, fourfold, hey, that's great too. But that's not going to save you. Any more than being saved like the thief on the cross who said, Lord, remember when you come to the kingdom, which you can't do. And you can't be saved like the man with palsy. He had four friends whose faith contributed to his salvation. But yet he was in the presence of Christ, so he couldn't do it. Zacchaeus was in the presence of Christ. And he was a Jew. He was already in a covenant relationship with God. So, man, that, that's not a good option either. But you still want to be saved without being baptized, don't you? We need to find another option for you. Let's see if we find another option. What are we going to do? Well, oh, I know. Here's one. Here's one. What about the prostitute? How about you want to be saved like this? Now, in Luke 7, Luke 7 and verse 36, there was one, not, I'm sorry, that, Luke 7. That is not the right verse there. And one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat, sat down to meet. And a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. And stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisees, now when the Pharisees which had bidden him saw it, he spake with himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who... And what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering, Jesus answering and said to him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he said, Master, say on. All right. So he tells a, he tells a, 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 a parable of a person who had uh, credit, who, who was uh, forgiven. And then he says, Simon answered, I suppose he that to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto her, unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, thou givest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman... Uh, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto uh, thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, but she, for she loved much, but to whom uh, little is forgiven, the same loveth little. Go ahead and put the phone lines up, Matt. I'm sorry. I've been not paying attention to the clock. So here he says, her sins are forgiven. She has many sins, but she's going to be forgiven. Now, this woman had faith. And she even washed. She washed Christ's feet. She anointed his feet. She wiped the, her, the feet, his feet with the hairs of her head. Anointed his feet with this precious ointment. Now, why don't, why don't you want to be saved like her? Why don't you want to be saved like her? I mean, isn't the, isn't the cry, you know, isn't the plea, well, you know, she wasn't baptized. I don't hear anybody saying, I want to be saved like this woman. I mean, why don't you go wash someone's feet in order to be saved? Would you do that? Would you wash someone's feet in order to be saved? I think some of you wouldn't because you'd have to get too close to the water. But she washed Christ's feet. Will you cry over your sins? 
this woman was was crying. Look, in Matthew 5 and verse 4, Matthew 5 and verse 4, Blessed are they that mourn. This is mourning for their sins, for they shall be comforted. So, will you do that? Will you anoint Jesus' feet in order to be forgiven? Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, you can't anoint Jesus' feet, can you? You can't wash Jesus' feet with your tears, can you? You can't wipe his feet with your with the hair of your head, can you? Because he's not here. But yet this woman wasn't baptized. And yet Jesus said her sins are forgiven. So do you want to be saved like her? He said, well, I can't be saved like her. Jesus is not here. I can't wash his feet. Well, we need to find you another option. Maybe we can find you another option here. What about the, this rich young ruler, the prosperous prince? In Luke 18, Luke 18, verse 18, a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus uh, said unto him, Why cost thou me good? None is good, uh, save uh one, that is God, thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. And he said, all these have I kept my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all thou hast to distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, and thou shalt have, have treasure in heaven. And come and follow me. And when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. And when Jesus saw him, saw that he was very sorrowful, he said, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? Well, here's another option for you. You can't be saved like the thief on the cross. You can't be saved like the man with palsy. You can't be saved like the woman that washed Jesus' feet. You can't be saved like Zacchaeus. So what about the rich young ruler? What about this man? This man, he knew the scripture. He was searching for eternal life. What, what good thing could I do to do, have eternal life? And yet when he heard what he must do, he was sorrowful. Now Jesus said to this man, if you want to inherit eternal life, give all you have and come follow me. Now, would you give all you have in order to be saved? I mean, Jesus said, what is a man's life? Right? What would a man give in exchange for his soul? Isn't that, isn't that right? I mean, how, how precious is your soul to you? What is a man proud if he gain the whole world and shall lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What would you give? Would you, would you give all that you have and go follow Christ? Why don't you want to be saved like this man? You know? Are you, are you not like this man at all? I mean, are, is it because you don't want to search? You're not looking? John 5, verse 39. Jesus said, Search the scriptures for any of you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. Is, it, is that it? You don't want to search? You don't want to study? This man has kept, this young man had kept uh, the commandments from his youth up. Maybe you don't want to be like this man. Maybe you don't want to study. Paul told Timothy, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman need not be ashamed, right? Divide the word of truth. Maybe, maybe you just don't want to spend. Maybe you don't want to give up your money. Maybe you don't want to give up all you have. But I don't see anybody, I don't, I don't see anybody saying, hey, I want to be saved like this rich young ruler. Well, why not? He wasn't baptized. I thought that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to get around baptism. Every time you throw up the thief on the cross, I mean, you hang him out there to show the world, hey, I'm, I'm going to be saved like the thief on the cross. Well, there's a whole lot of other options that are a whole lot uh, suitable, or just as suitable anyway. But no one wants to be saved like them. Why not? You know why? 
You know why? It's because really when it gets right down to it, friends, you just don't want to do what the Lord says. You know, Jesus made this statement. There was a certain lawyer stood up tempting him saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, who is, who is my neighbor? You know, Jesus says, love thy neighbor. And this man asked a question about inheriting eternal life. And yet when Jesus gave the answer, his response was, I'm trying to get around what God said. And I submit to you, friends, the reason why people I always say, what about a thief on the cross? It's because they're trying to justify themselves by not doing what God said do. You want to be saved without being baptized? Why don't, why don't you choose to be saved like this rich young ruler, this prosperous prince, and give all you have? Why, why don't you want to be saved like the woman that washed Jesus' feet? Why don't you want to be saved like Zacchaeus? Why don't you want to be saved like the, the man with palsy? You know why you can't be saved like the thief on the cross or the man of palsy or the rich young ruler or Zacchaeus or, or <clears throat> the woman that washed Jesus' feet or this rich young ruler? Because in all those cases, in all those uh, accounts we read, there's one thing, there's one thing they all had in common. And that is they were all in the presence of Jesus when they asked the question, and when Jesus was willing to grant them eternal life or forgiveness of sins, if they did certain things, they were all in the presence of Jesus. Now, you know what? You can't do that today. You can't be saved like any of these people because Christ is not here physically to forgive your sins. In Mark 2 and verse 10, Mark 2 and verse 10, notice what the Bible says. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thy house. Now, do you hear what Jesus just did? See, Jesus said unto the, the man who was sick, Thy sins be forgiven thee. Arise, take up thy bed and walk. And the, and the people that were there said, Wait a minute, nobody can forgive sins but God. And Jesus said, Well, wait a minute. Which is easier to do? Forgive sins or say, Take up thy bed and walk? If either one of them was actually going to happen, it would be because God was behind it. Only God can forgive sins. Well, guess what? Only God can make someone take up their bed and walk. And so he says, which is easier? So take up thy bed and walk or forgive sins? He said, but that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. I'm going to say, take up thy bed and walk. Jesus, while he was on the earth, had the power to forgive sins. He had the power to forgive sins. Friends, you cannot be saved like anybody who had their sins forgiven while in the presence of Jesus because Jesus is not in your presence today. He's not in your presence today. We have, we have, we're under a new law, a new system. And that requires, that requires obedience to this new law. Look at this. In Hebrews, and I'm about to run out of time here. In Hebrews <clears throat> chapter 9 and verse 15, notice this. For this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by the means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of an eternal Inheritance, verse 16. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of a testator. For a testament is of a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Jesus was bringing in a new testament. 
But before that testament went into effect, that is before he died, he could forgive sins. And friends, that's the way he forgives sins today now. He's died. He's died on the cross. He brought in a new testament. And now that testament says that in order, in order to, you, for, to have your sins forgiven, here's what you must do. You must believe and be baptized in order to be saved. Jesus said, Go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Salvation, remission of sins, is only going to happen after you believe Jesus Christ, Son of God, you repent of your sins, you confess Christ before man, and you're baptized for the remission of your sins. That's the only way it's going to take place today. Friends, you can't be saved like any of those people. But you can be saved like the people on the day of Pentecost. You can be saved like the people on the day of Pentecost because they were told after Christ died what to do to be saved. That is repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, friends, why not be saved like them? Why not be saved like them? Friends, we're out of time. So I'm going to put my contact information up here and then we're going to close. If we're going to sit you in any way, help you to be saved as the Bible teaches, we want to do that very thing. Till next time, thanks for watching. Always remember to ask, what does the Bible say? And you'll get a word from the Lord. Have a good night.